Welcome to Writers Speak, dedicated to the written word and those who produce it. I am your host, Jeannie Sloan, and the author of two historical fictions, She Built Ships and She Flew Bombers During World War II. Thank you for joining us on Writers Speak. Today in the studio, I would like to welcome Jeff Cotton. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. My pleasure, truly. It's nice to be back. Well, we have been talking about all your screenplays. You are so prolific. Now, we're going to discuss your third screenplay. And the name of this one is called Dark, Dangerous Homecoming. How does this relate to the reckoning of Billy Barnes and the Little Dragon? Great. When they came from a thousand page book that I wrote, or that wrote me, and in it, the character of the Little Dragon was the main character, this kid named Mike, and his sidekick was Billy Barnes. And so the first screenplay I've ever written when actually was Little Dragon. It was about this boy, Mike. And then suddenly the Billy Barnes story came roaring out. It came out and it was so good that it took me two years of rewriting Little Dragon to get it as good as Billy Barnes. And in that, these are these two standalone screenplays. I never set out to write this third screenplay, The Dark Dangerous Homecoming. It was never meant to be a trilogy. But when it came and it bubbled up, it wrote the fastest of the three. In some way, it just was a collision of energy because Billy Barnes took place in San Francisco, 1978 to 1979. Little Dragon took place in Georgia, and the last page, he ends up in San Francisco. And only then, in the third script, do you get that Billy Barnes is with this guy, Miguel, and Mike is with Johnny Barnes, his twin brother, but you don't even know that they're twin brothers until the third part when they all kind of collide in San Francisco. And in that moment, to a backdrop of uh, 1979, set in 79 because they were always about pre-AIDS. I didn't want AIDS anywhere synonymous with gay because up until then, boy, from about 1982 to 2000, so much of what was written was gay, AIDS, gay, AIDS, and I wanted that out of the way. So they were set then. And I watched this kind of collision of energy of Billy getting back with his twin brother, Johnny, and these two boyfriends that they have. And the setup was in The Reckoning of Billy Barnes. We met Bert and Betty, this kindly couple that own this diner, which is kind of like the anchor in the middle of hell of all this stuff. And in the first part, Reckoning of Billy Barnes, Billy joins this Menendez crime family and what it cost him to get out, almost cost him his life but they essentially have his gun with his fingerprints tied into a murder. So it's activated by the Menendez family wants Billy to kill someone for them and they can put him in jail if he doesn't. So that's one of the storylines running. And at the same point, there's a serial monster in this book. The monster who is a really scary as hell character. I mean, for me, it's very interesting as the author to say, I've created one of the scariest characters I've ever seen in print and he was and he had a certain humor to him. So in this backdrop, this guy is going after Little Dragon. And in there, there are these storylines that kind of parallel right along, and you don't even know that they are parallel stories until they kind of collide at the end. The whole thing's a collision, and when it heals, it's a homecoming. But it was dark, and it was dangerous, but don't forget the word is homecoming because these are stories that heal. Mm -hmm. These are stories you earn the light. These are about boys who don't cut the deal and who stand up and come to their integrity, and in there, there's a real, ah, okay. That's a nice place to end. Doesn't matter how I, crazy it is. I like that all your screenplays have happy endings. <laughs> 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 I think in our hearts, we always want a happy ending to yeah, well, stories that we get really involved in. Right. I don't want the cynical ending or there's no way to beat the system ending or, yeah. you know, th those don't... Or somebody dies, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't move me. <laughs> what moves me is I don't care how dark it is as long as the light is commensurate and by the time as long it's as we there, get some light. 
Yeah, earn the light. <laughs> these are earn the light screenplays. They are dark, dangerous love stories is how I refer to them, but that's the key word. They are love stories in the end that people haven't seen before. I mean, these are very hardcore kids. One was illiterate. Uh, one once has dreams of being in the Olympics. Mike is this really good boy. He was an Eagle Scout who clearly he's going to college, you know, and there's a place that they have these dreams, and they're not stereotypes, but they're kids who get thrown out early because to this day, to this day, 25% of kids are getting killed, kicked out of their homes. To this day, 30% of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual kids still attempt suicide. To this day, 50% of transgender kids attempt suicide. While it's all better at the same point, there's a lot of kids who hit the streets. CNN recently came up with 40 to 50% of the homeless population are LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, questioning, and I, intersex kids right now, 40 to 50% of us are on the street to this day. So these things said in 79 are current as hell, really. It's about now as much as it is about then. And um, I failed to mention your background because when you're giving me all those statistics, um, we always have to remember you are a screenplay, playwright, but you also have a um, marriage and family therapy license. degree license. And also I'm a trainer with the National Foster Parent Association. So now, I've worked in group yes. homes for 35 years with kids on the streets, abused, abandoned kids. Mm -hmm. So I know this world well. You have a good background to write these screenplays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being a gay kid also, having yes. been a gay kid and, and found my way, mm -hmm. you know, when I came out, there was no space in my family for, for me to be myself. My parents would, don't do this, don't tell this person, don't be like this, don't act this way. And finally, I looked at them and I said, well, you get to treat me second class. You really do. You don't get to do it up close. And I did a driveway car at that point, sight unseen, Massachusetts to San Francisco. And the joke I used in another one of our episodes was, yeah, I moved to San Francisco, my favorite city, where the women are tough and the men are pretty. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted somewhere where I could just be myself. And I've been with my partner, Doug, 30 years now, which is actually like 210 and gay because we're doing dog years now and on a relationship. So we've been together <laughs> a long time and uh, <laughs> almost half of my life mm -hmm. has been with a partner that was unseeable when I came out in 1963. So these boys come home against all odds. They find their way back to one another, and that's important. You have a wonderful passion in your stories, and I can tell you just are a very passionate person. Yeah, these truthful kids, they were always real to me. I mean, always real to me from the beginning. When they first came out, within six pages of writing it, I was dying to start sharing it with people because it was just the truth. You know, I call them emotional autobiographies because they were real, and I didn't often know where they were going, but I trusted the process. I trusted they would find their way home. And they, when they did, they healed me as much as I, you know, healed them, I'm so to really speak. curious in, in talking to you, uh, you, you talk a lot about this person read it, this person read it, that person read it. How many people do you think you've had reading your screenplays? About 50. I would say and probably half of them were professional evaluators that I would work with, you know, people who would really not be afraid to tell me, nope, that scene didn't work, that didn't work. And what was so cool, you know, what made me such a good writer and why these things are so interesting is that I was never trying to get them perfect. They were always better. Every, every correction mm -hmm. was better. And in that moment, I was endlessly interested in, if you said a scene didn't work, I was interested in, okay, then what would make it work rather than fight for, oh no, it did work, you just didn't see it. If you didn't see it, I didn't say it clear enough. And in that moment, I remember one of the persons who I worked with who was an Emmy Golden Globe winning screenwriter, Eric Bork, said, oh, I'd like to give you notes and have you sit with them for about four days or so. I said, no, I got to do it within 24 hours. I would have made those changes days earlier. If a scene didn't work, I would have made those changes. We'd be having a moot point conversation. So in there, because they were truthful stories, I was just passionate about just telling the truth and working it and working, reworking it and just getting it better and better and better. And, you know, every time I read it to anyone out loud, there are always little corrections here and there. It'll never be done, but they're in the good enough place now. They're yeah. <laughs> done that way. Endless passion, endless perseverance, and also 
if I didn't get so wiped out as a gay kid, I never would have had the perseverance and passion to have told these stories about boys who don't cut the deal, who become themselves. Well, it's really wonderful that you've had so many people helping you uh, write these screenplays, and um, in a way, uh, it helped you polish them. You just oh, yeah. polished them and polished them, and now they shine. Yeah. Yeah, it was the over and over and over, you know, because the screenplay is so different. For anyone, if you've ever, you know, the difference between a screenplay and a novel, because, Gene, you've written a couple novels. In the novel, the original novel I wrote, which I never meant to get published because it was an exorcism for me, I had the freedom to say whatever I want, in, embellish it in whatever detail. Screenplay is a laser beam. Every scene needs to justify itself. If I can save a word in a sentence, I'm a happy man. I would work with one guy in Colorado and he would say, trim, trim, trim the dialogue, trim the dialogue. And he would, I would get it down to the bare bone essence of what the truth was with nothing off course, laser beam truth of mm -hmm. something. And it took a long time to get truthful in that way. You have um, a lot of uh, powerful prey upon the most vulnerable. Yes. One of the themes, yes. And these reoccur in your work quite a bit. Yeah. Can you explain why that is? As much as it's great to have a great protagonist, if we don't have a good antagonist for them to overcome, then it just doesn't mean a rip. As a, Eric Bork, who read Reckoning of Billy Barnes and Little Dragon, said, he said, you do the two things that make you one of the two most powerful you know, writers I've ever worked with. And I said, well, what is that? And he said, A, you have a protagonist that people care about. You have a hero that somebody wants in their corner. And it's true. If I'm watching a movie and I don't give a rip about the hero, I don't care. And I'll turn it off somewhere along the way because it doesn't matter if they win or whatever. So A, you have a great protagonist. And B, they're up against life and death, high stakes conflicts. Mm -hmm. So right away, we're drawn into caring about someone and kind of get on some level they're fighting for their lives and so yeah the monster in this one is really to me probably the most interesting of any of the villains because he's quirky and he's funny and his his name outside of this is Brett Noel Lee which is my three brothers middle names you know Robert Noel, Daniel Lee, Lawrence Brett. And one people said, what are you saying? I said, well, the monster's in the family, so to speak. <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, so he gets to be part of all of this. But again, that's what makes it so powerful is that you care about this little hero and there's almost no way that he's going to be able to beat what he's going to beat. And when he does, it's like, yeah, okay, how about that? <laughs> Tell me, what can we do as a society to help the lost boys that you write about, the ones that get kicked out of their homes, yeah. are forced to feed for themselves, fend for themselves, or try to feed, feed themselves. <laughs> what can we do as a society? I guess I'm asking you as mm -hmm. a therapist. Right. For me, the biggest deal is recognizing that everyone pays a price for keeping homosexual America in the closet. It isn't just about, oh, those poor gays. If we recognize that everyone then gets frozen in roles, because if we lock, you know, gays into... Um, being less than real men, then you get men who are terrified to in any way to break down and weep and show their feelings in any deep way because they're afraid of looking like sissies or looking like girls. I mean, if you see virtually any comedy show to this day and you have two men who hug, they don't stay hugging without some sort of thing happening afterwards where they have to assert their heterosexuality and do that. And then women get frozen in the role that women can't be strong without being, you know, using the word bitches or, or being uh, accused of being lesbians or whatever. So everyone gets caught in roles if we can't finally land in the truth of everyone pays a price for keeping gays in the closet. Everyone pays. Is that then we don't have the freedom just to be human. And uh, yeah, so what I think is a big deal is that people get, oh, my own freedom is tied into helping other people get free. It isn't just helping them get free, but I get free too. So that's why it's not teaching tolerance, Gene. It's the celebration of diversity. 
Because teaching tolerance is, I don't really like you, but they're a hate crime, so I can't really do what I want to do to you because I have to tolerate you, as opposed to the celebration of diversity. I have never had anyone who is really ragingly homophobic, who A, I'm not dealing with, who A, isn't either secretly gay themselves or hiding their own secret sins. Otherwise, they just wouldn't be so railingly crazy about it. So to recognize that our biggest detractors, the loudest voice in the room, is always the voice of fear. And whenever we hear that loud political voice, it's always someone who's very frightened and constricted inside. I've never met anyone comfortable in their own skin who had a problem with me in mind, but I've met a lot of constricted people who are stuck in theirs, who got all finger pointy about how you should act and how you should be, and I got they were so full of self-loathing and self-judgment that I may be a sinner, but I'm not like them. You know, and that's what all prejudice serves. The prejudice serves that distortion of I'm better than you. And in there, now, it's all human. These, this isn't the gay stories. In the end, they are. But it's the universal story to become ourselves. What's it cost us to stand up? But what's it cost us to not? Everyone. Well, speaking of diversity, you have a uh, wide range of ethnic groups in your stories and uh, different uh, socio-economical um, uh, groups. How uh, are you able to write about such a diverse uh, amount of people in your um, screenplays? Mm -hmm. One, having worked in group homes for years, I worked with a whole lot of different ethnicities, so that was useful for me. Mm -hmm. Um, there aren't many women in the screenplays. The, the, the I was going to ask you that question. Besides Betty, who Betty and Bert run the diner, mm -hmm. and they're like the quintessential grandparents, the grandmother. But the only women are kind of the drag queens <laughs> in there, kind of. Yeah. Um, but they really you were. You are lacking on the women department. I was wondering about that. Well, the juvenile hall, there's not really women no, in there. No, that's very true. And Billy's world of, of hustling would really bring him into and contact with, with gay tricks more than anyone else and the dark, dangerous homecoming. Uh -huh. It's that world. So I in guess, that world, uh, it's male-dominated. I guess group homes are uh, separated yep. also then, yeah. Yeah. And so you don't have women working uh, in a boy's home? Oh, no, or? that's not true. We have, it's easier for women to work in a boy's home than it is for men to work in a girl's oh. home because the charges c could come up pretty quickly. You oh, know, gay men can I work see. with girls almost easier because then many times that sexuality isn't part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but the first time I realized, A, it was easy for me to have, a, you know, a black heroes in there mm -hmm. um, because I used to work in a black alcohol program and I was like the one white counselor who was hired. And one day I was running a group and about 45 minutes into the group, I looked around and realized, oh, I'm the only white person here. And then I had this great thought of, wow, how about that? If I was racist, that would have been the first thing I noticed was I'm the only person here. So... <laughs> I think it was the absolute celebration of other people's diversity and cultures that mm -hmm. allowed me to have different ethnicities in the screenplay playing different roles in there. I mean, Miguel Cruz is this, you know, Chicano boy, you know, a strong Chicano boy who is Johnny's partner. Your uh, description of places even are uh, pretty diverse and amazing. Uh, seedy hotel rooms, sprawling mansions, uh, greasy spoons, cozy homes. And again, how are you able to describe such a variety of uh, places uh, so well? I had read somewhere in writing screenplays is that it's like if you saw Little Miss Sunshine, the van is actually a character in the book. You know, they have to push the van to get it started and all that stuff. Uh -huh. So in there, in the Hustler Hotel, when, they, when the boys check into this Hustler Hotel and Marty behind the desk sees their hands touch and gets, these boys are in love. I mean, he's incredulous and finally his room 526 boys, the honeymoon suite. I mean, he puts them up in this, you know, old garish decaying bordello that has, you know, burnt, 
you know, lamps with burnt shades and erotic paint by number quality murals and a broken down bed with a ripped to hell canopy over it and a bathroom that when they turn on the lights, roaches die for crevices. But the honeymoon suite becomes a character and Ackmore juvenile prison in Little Dragon. That's a character, monstrous, archaic, three story building desolates the, the oh. landscape. So it becomes a place that you that you are. And Bert and Betty's diner, which is quirky, homey, uh -huh. inviting, none of the tables or chairs match, same for the eclectic customers. Oh. So that's a character, probably like a Hamburger Mary's was back in San Francisco, is that the location also becomes a character. And so when I realized that, it was like, oh, then fill it in that you are there. Where are you? Oh, Bert and Betty's Diner, this quirky thing run by this quintessential grandparent couple, Bert and Betty. So it becomes a character as well. So when we read your screenplays, it's important to look at all the places as possible symbolism. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that would be true. Yeah. Burton Betty's office an innocence in the middle of hell for both Billy Barnes and then, but in Even later screenplay for Mike. Even with the mismatching furniture. Oh yeah. yeah, but it becomes home. There's a place that's finally anchored. It has innocence in the middle of hell. And so, you know, for me, the screenplays for anyone, there, it's a journey worth taking. A, because it a, brings people to a world they haven't been before. In fact, I had a filmmaker read the Little Dragon script, and at the end, I was a huge fan of the Lord of the Rings stuff. He sat down with me and he said, you know, you've created a world as visual as the Lord of the Rings. And I was stunned by that, and I was deeply honored by the compliment because I loved the Lord of the Rings for where it put me. And he said, you've created the world that absolutely is as real as that. And uh, that to me was a great honor. So it is, it's, it's, a, it's a ride worth taking because people haven't been in this world, don't know this world, but it gives an empathy for the world. And then when it heals, we get to see, oh yeah, how about that? Healing is possible no matter how bad the wipeout is. The, um, what genre would you say the dark, um, dangerous homecoming is? Absolute thriller hardcore thriller, rough, wild tumble. At times it's almost near a horror movie with the monster because the, the torture room that he has is its own character too and that's just a downright scary place. Um, How but, hard was that to write about? Kind of easy. <laughs> well, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but he was created in the book and so in there, there was something about giving him a place that when you got there and when Mike does find a way to take him down in his own sanctuary, there's a place that you kind of get against unbelievable odds. This moral little kid, little, little dragon, little Mike F. Capra, Mike Frank Capra, by the way, his middle name was, takes down this monster in the middle of hell. It's like, yeah, how about that? You know, <laughs> you know, it is. It's the David and Goliath story. It's, it's been uh -huh. told over and over and over in so many different ways. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Scared the hell out of Jean, by the way. These stories yeah. were like really hard I for know. her to read. I, I did have trouble. <laughs> yeah. So I had to um, beg our um, a producer here to help me with the questions because I had to skip through it. <laughs> right. But that's important to know. As I say, they're hardcore thrillers, but I once heard the definition of shock is the distance between who we are and what we don't let in about ourselves. And that it became almost a crucible of who could journey there. But also what's so nice is it doesn't just take you into this dark world, but it also brings the light in in a way that it, it's like commensurate with the darkness is great light, great hope, great integrity, great innocence, and love does conquer all. I mean, and that really is the theme of this. In the end, there's an ah, <laughs> ah. You know, it's a journey worth taking because it is a homecoming. Yeah, I, the, the end is, it's so good to have a good ending. <laughs> yeah. It's a relief after the uh, scary parts. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a relief mm -hmm. to not get left in that darkness, to not be left yeah, in there's no hope, there's no way out. Not to be left no in the out. darkness. Yeah, so great optimism while it's willing to go rip roaring dark. Hardcore thrillers that go right to the edge, but when they come back and heal, they heal. 
and people are healed in the reading. I mean, so it's an interesting crucible. They healed me, and many people who read them are like, ah, that was a journey worth taking. Hmm. When I read it to a friend of mine in the That's end. That's such a compliment. Ah, thank you. To have somebody say, that was a journey worth taking. They're talking about your writing, and that's just such a compliment. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, a friend of mine who worked in juvenile halls, when we first got into the first half, she was like this to it. And in the end, she said, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, she was really excited because everyone got theirs. The villains get theirs and the heroes get theirs. Mm -hmm. And everyone kind of gets what they deserve, you know, both love and whatever else the villains get. They deserve that too. So everyone kind of gets theirs in the best and worst senses of it. Now, you have a lot of minor uh, characters in this uh, screenplay. Yeah. Uh, are, do they have some symbolism? What is the purpose in some of these minor characters mm -hmm. that you have in there? Bert and Betty, as the quintessential grandparents, represent home. You know, there's a place that and represents family because that is the healing that many gay kids had to hit the streets early and create family somewhere else. So there are places that then it becomes people who kind of take them in, that there's a place that, that, that when people love us, many times we can just do so much more that someone's got my back or there's a place to come home to, that that's kind of what they offered Billy that Billy was illiterate in book one and remained illiterate, but he came home because they gave him a place and they loved him. And they even introduced him at one point, this is our grandson Billy, because he's theirs. And, and when they come through from Mike, who's trying to get his A, he gets his GET, the GED. Mike's a bright kid who's looking for a scholarship. And when that gets turned down, Bert and Betty, who come through for him because their own son had these dreams, and Bert and Betty are, follow your dreams, want you to follow your dreams, and we'll help you follow your dreams. That's important that people have our backs because we can't do it alone. None of us do it alone. So yeah, the side characters matter a lot. Um, even that strange little creature, Marty, at the Paradise Hotel, it is a place that he somehow cares about these kids even though he's this yeah, and twisted he, little golem character. And he was a minor character. Yeah. That and added to the story. Oh, yeah, he did. Oh, yeah. indeed, I do, I do, I do. He was actually the creepiest character for me to write. He was like <laughs> such a creep. I said, he's some part of me, too. Obviously, if you want to make him real, some part of me is, is him as well as the monster, as well as Mike, and well as Billy. I find it fun to write about quirky characters like I can tell that you do also. Yeah, yeah. It makes him real. Who wants to read about run-of-the-mill kind of people <laughs> all the time? <laughs> Well, they're not so interesting. No. And yet when there's also the there's, there's truthful knit of heart to it, like Monique, this drag queen that, that you meet in, in book one, she's both, you know, over the top, trashy, trashy makeup, jewelry, but a no-nonsense truth-telling mama all at once while she's garish and outlandish. She also tells the truth, you know, and so that's kind of nice is that sometimes, you know, the quirkiest of characters tell these very honorable truths. So now you have produced, uh, I mean, you have written your third uh, screenplay, um, and we're certainly rooting for you to have them produced yeah. into plays. Uh, with movies. Movies. Plays sound interesting, too, in a way, <laughs> though it would be <laughs> difficult. <laughs> This is funny. I mean, when I went to pitch Little Dragon, which is a hardcore juvenile hall thriller, uh -huh. I pitched it to a place called Noble House that was looking for a socially relevant film with a male teen lead. Pitch it to three people. The two assistants loved it, and the owner of the company looked and said, any chance of making that a musical? <laughs> I burst out laughing. I mean, I just said, oh, this is so funny. This is so antithetical <laughs> to what it is. But she had just seen Chicago, I guess, back then. Oh. But in that moment, it was, you know, that was just off the wall in some way of how they get made. No, so the hope is to get them made. Mm -hmm. Little Dragon and The Reckoning of Billy Barnes are these standalone screenplays that absolutely could be made into individual, independent films. But my biggest dream uh -huh. is the trilogy. HBO, Showtime, Encore, somebody that wants to take on the girl with the dragon tattoo, hornet's nest, green earrings, with a gay teen hustler heroes, kids who find their way home. It's a world that no one's seen before, and it would be a pleasure in some way. That's my hope. The trilogy is really kind of like the deepest of the hopes, mm -hmm. while the other two stand alone as they are. 
this one needs the other two to be told. Otherwise, it doesn't get made if the others don't because it's too tied into the others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I certainly hope this comes to fruition uh, to see all the trilogy, trilogies made into uh, screen plays and um, produced into a final film. Yeah. Um, I wish you all the luck in the future, and thank you for joining us on Writers Speak, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for having me, because this is a chance to be able to, you know, if people are looking, this is a chance for them to be able to take a look at something that they might not want to touch, and yet there's not just social relevance to it. There's a place that these are stories that deserve to get told. We get to be the hero of the film, because when people think about LGBT kids, many times we're most, mainly the victim of the movies. You know, we're not the stars of the movie and we're not the heroes, but we get to be heroes too because we are. are and we will make sure um, that uh, you may be easily reached by reading the credits at the end of the show. Sweet. Sweet. And um, I would like to thank everybody for joining us on Writers Speak that has been produced at the Community Media Center of the North Bay. I also would like to thank our sponsor, the Sonoma County Gazette. Please join us next time for another episode with a new author.